evening everybody and thank you for joining us um this is the first of two sessions that we're running to try and find a time that suits as many people as possible just as we've just mentioned looking at about how we can make more of the astro tourism op opportunity on exmoor so for those of you that don't know me i'm the sustainable economy manager for exmoor national park dan james um and katrina works with me and she's been leading the way in all of our dark sky tourism work so she'll be talking to you about some of the things we've got going on but i just really wanted to start with a bit of context really and history lesson if you like in terms of where we've come from in dark sky small's always had relatively dark skies um you know compared to the rest of the country we have limited light pollution um and also compared to some of the other dark sky locations in the country we are also we have going to emphasize here relatively fewer free nights um so sorry relatively more cloud free nights it is relative because we still have our fair share of cloudy nights but um that is a bit of an advantage we perhaps have over some of our northern competitors but it wasn't until 2009 when it the united nations declared um nine as the international year of astronomy and through that they, there was quite a lot of work done within the uk and that was really when people began to take more of an interest in dark sky particularly it's when the idea of having designations for dark sky areas and proactively trying to look after our dark skies really came to a fore and that was when approached by um actually it was the guy who was coordinating that year of astronomy in the uk who kind of came to exmoor and said do you know what you really could and should become a dark skies reserve you've got a chance of being the first in europe so the competitive edge in us two of us and we said let's go for it um so that's what we did and we were successful in 2011 being designated europe's first international dark sky reserve um at the time we were second in the world um ontario at the time oh i think about seven or eight dark sky reserves within the uk there are also various other dark sky designations so there are dark sky parks which are for largely uninhabited areas um and i know richard has got a lot of experience in working with northumberland which is a dark sky park um forested gallery was a, a, the first dark sky park so there's lots of different designations there just two of them um but 2011 was quite a big moment for us to be able to say that we are very first dark sky reserve of press interest some of you might remember ryan cox who was at the time kind of just starting out really in his tv career having been a professor of physics and um had his stargazing live program on the bbc which became quite a big kind of prime time hit if you like and exmoor was featured on that we had a live big switch off some of you might remember in dolverton um it was a very misty night you couldn't see a single star <laughs> um but never mind um you know hundreds of people but the, the town was closed off to traffic the people came out into a town square and after a live countdown you know they they, they, they sought to turn off all of the lights within the, the town to really demonstrate the impact that lighting has even within a dark sky reserve and so you know that's just one example we've had numerous press articles etc all writing and highlighting exmoor's dark skies I think you know come a few years later and to think there's a bit more that we could and should be doing to promote our dark skies a few businesses had grappled with offer some dark sky experiences they'd often struggled a little bit one to have a confidence and a knowledge as to what they were sharing um also there was some concerns around the fickleness of the uk weather and how how do you actually promote Sky experience and then cope with that kind of moment when you know the clouds come come in so that's kind of where we got to and we started the dark sky festival in 2018 which was an opportunity to really say dark skies are about more than astronomy and it's always a point that we're keen to emphasize astronomy becomes a focal point and for good reason too but the dark skies are also about you know experiencing darkness nocturnal wildlife um arts history culture there's lots of different elements that all come into dark skies and you know the, the anecdote we often tell is that 
I think every year now in, that we've done the festival, we've always done a walk over Dunkery, um, rain to lead walk, and it's often been tied, tried to tie in with a meteor shower, and every time it's been thick mist, and you can barely see your hand <laughs> in front of your face. So what we've actually found is that still, that's been one of the most popular events, and I think the first year we did it, it was a big storm had rolled in, and I had a debate, is it safe to go ahead? Possibly, possibly not turn up in the car park just in case anybody is foolhardy enough to turn up and in actual fact kind of 80 odd people turned up and they had a dark sky experience so they didn't see the stars but it it's about more than just astronomy so we started the festival and that's been going for a few years now and obviously this year Katrina will talk a bit later is going to look a bit different with Covid but la about this time last year we were also keen to look at what more we could do to support businesses to really take the opportunity of our dark skies whether it's going the full hog and running kind of their own activities and experiences based on it or whether maybe it's an accommodation provider just being a bit more aware of their dark skies a bit more confident to be able to promote them to their guests having some kit available maybe for guests so that's really where some of the work that katrina is going to talk about has been developed from that starting point it got a bit delayed what with covid etc and, and i think that's the final point i wanted to make in this intro really is that we're looking at this a long time before coronavirus had really reared its ugly head we now look at the kind of tourism recovery work we're involved with i think the dark skies give x more really good opportunity we're just about to publish tomorrow the results of a virtual visitor survey that we ran and almost a third of visitors are saying that the dark skies of interest to them. So these are people who potentially might come back to Exmoor. They're all saying they're really keen to come back. And a third of them are saying the dark sky reserve status is an attractor to the area. And about a third as well are also saying that they'd be really interested in undergoing, undertaking stargazing and dark sky activities whilst here. And that's quite an increase on previous surveys. Now, different because previous surveys have actually asked you do when you were here out your intentions and we all know that we often go on holiday with a long list of intentions we'd like to do but we don't always get to do all of it so um, you know forwards I think with Covid the dark skies one of the things we're keen to do is extend the season that's always been an aim of dark skies and I think particularly this year when we know that many businesses are wanting to some of the lost business from the start of the year and look at trading further into the autumn and winter to give us quite a competitive edge and quite a unique thing to to kind of focus on so i'm going to pause now and hand over to richard um richard has got a wealth of experience that we've go to stargazing to talk about some of the opportunities really in a bit more detail for exmoor and for exmoor businesses so richard over to you um can you all hear me okay Good stuff. Um, okay, how many of you that I can see on this screen can see the Milky Way from where you actually live? You can put your hand up. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, that's the majority. If I was to do this Zoom or life size with somewhere that's more of an urban area, or in fact over much of the United Kingdom, virtually nobody would put their hand up. Okay. There's about eight out of ten Brits can't see the Milky Way from where they live. That's why you people are the chosen people. You live in one of the most beautiful parts of the UK from a night skies perspective as well as a, day, a daytime perspective. Um, my background, I'm a, a former government press officer. Um, astronomy was just simply a hobby. Um, but then the dark sky conservation start, um, starts really through the PR and then I got involved in it with Northumberland. And since then, I've gone on to help um, other national parks and Cranbourne Chase, which got designated as a reserve last year, of course, with a very similar events to this, although we were, we were there in the flesh and the blood, uh, which was nice. And I wish I could have been down there next more tonight as well for that. So it's a growing movement, um, a little bit of sort of uh, Bush Telegraph news. I think the Yorkshire Dales and both the North York Moors in the north of England are both applying this time around to be reserves. OK, so the competition is growing in terms of how many areas have got dark sky designation um you've got a special secret weapon though and the special secret weapon is of all the designated landscapes certainly across england you are the darkest 
Um, we can have a we can have a fight in a pub late at night after a few drinks about whether it's Northumberland or Exmoor. Um, but when we actually look at the survey results, when we look at the Dark Sky meter readings, and these are the things that Dark Sky people like me use to test how dark the sky is, and an Exmoor would have done scores of these during its application process, as Northumberland did, they're almost identical in their, their darkest areas. So if people come along and say, oh no, the darkest part of England is Kielder Forest, you've got a very good shout in that fight to say, well, actually, it's probably somewhere in Exmoor. They're so similar. Don't worry about it, but it gives you almost a unique selling proposition to actually be able to outcompete other areas that are becoming dark sky designated. I think going forward over the next few years, I'd, I'd expect to see the Lake District designated. They've got somebody working full time on it now. Probably one or two other areas of outstanding natural beauty, but it won't alter the fact you can actually legitimately say in your marketing and tout it on your Twitter feeds or on your websites. We are probably, we are the darkest area in England, okay? So that's good. And as Dan's just told us, you are blessed with, with godly weather. So you can, you can see the stars most times when we're under, struggling under some, some terrible cloud. Um, the dark sky astro uh, tourism movement really is, um, is a way for people like me or at heart are astronomers of making dark sky sustainable and trying to convince people um, you and local authorities, government agencies, tourist boards, that preserving something that's naturally given to us is a very good idea and you can actually make some revenue from it as well, particularly in the shoulder seasons. Um, last year, um, Northumberland commissioned a, a special report to try to analyse what impact dark sky tourism had actually had on the northeast economy. And staggeringly, it, it estimated that it was now worth £25 million every year to the Northumberland economy, which I find it's an independent report. I've certainly seen the draft of it. Um, it generates about 450 jobs. So for an area like Northumberland, it's given them a profile they wouldn't have had. And I suspect the same might be true of Exmoor as well, which is a relatively small national park. But all of a sudden you have this profile, as Dan said, from this fantastic publicity that you got in 2011. And, and that predates when Northumberland became a dark sky park. In fact, I think after Galloway, you were the second tranche of areas that became designated. And so I think you're the first in Europe, is that correct? I think it is, isn't it, Dan? Yeah, so that, that, that's the case. So all this is something to celebrate. From me as a, an astronomer's point of view, I want you to try and um, promote stargaze and make some revenue from it. And out of that, we might get more um, ways of controlling light pollution. So we actually preserve the night sky. That's such a fundamental feature of a, of a night in Exmoor. What's the difference between your sky and the sky that I actually live under? Well, it's chalk and cheese. I can see, on a good night, I can see 50 stars, just about. Um, on the same night where you live, you'll see 2,500 stars. I can't see the Milky Way from anywhere within a, a reasonable distance of where I live. For you, it's an obvious, obvious sight. And so this autumn, now we're entering the prime Milky Way season. If you look above your head at around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, as it starts to get really dark, you'll see the Milky Way shimmering like a band. There are people, I've done scores of events after a tourism events. I've done weekend packages for hotels. I've done star parties for pubs. We've been out in, in campsites. The one thing everybody wants to see is the Milky Way, okay? And if you can deliver on that by encouraging them to come when the moon's not up, which will be something we'll cover in the practical sessions that are coming up. You know, when's the best time to encourage people to come? Well, when the moon's out of the sky, it's gonna be darker. There are some things you can offer them almost for free in terms of looking up that are so powerful. By the way, the other things people want to see, by and large, are, are the northern lights, which were probably not the best place to see in XML compared with the more northern ones, and also the planets, Saturn in particular. And if you look due south tonight at 12 o'clock, you will see Saturn. It's the, the dim yellow star just to the left of a much brighter planet um, called uh, Jupiter. Okay, so if you're su suitably enthused by all that, um, and you sign up for our um, our special um, three event um, training. We're going to cover a host of issues. Okay, we'll we'll go through light pollution. In fact, while I'm here, why don't I just try and do a screen share and I'll show you what light pollution looks like for most people. So bear with me one second while I do this fantastic piece of technology. And if it doesn't work, you can swear at me. Um, I'm hoping somebody hasn't got their mic mute. Can you see my screen? Yeah, that's working. 
Okay. Um, this is a program, this is a website called lightpollutionmap.info. Um, this is the website that anybody in dark skies uses to have a look at light pollution. And one of the best things about it is it's updated on an annual basis. Okay, so lots of light pollution maps. This is the one that's the most recent. Um, from that screen, you can see the blobby red and the white areas. Well, that is really bad news for stargazers. These are the worst areas in Europe to actually try and see anything. And you'll see that Western Europe is not as anything like as good as you might think. In fact, the Benelux countries are a real viable market for dark sky tourism um, for areas of England like Exmoor, very much so. If we were to focus particularly on Britain, well, look at that. London dominates the South in terms of light pollution, but the North, it's actually collectively, the North is probably worse all the way from the Midlands up to Lancashire and into West Yorkshire. But look at the virtuous people down there. So whether it's colored blue, these are the best areas for stargazing anywhere in England. And you can see you've, only, you've got the only true dark skies left in southern England. And they're very comparable with the skies of mid Wales. I think you can see that as well. And if we come up to the north of England, actually you fare pretty well down there, don't you? So these would be the dales through the central span of, uh, of England and all the way up here. And that collar of dark skies is the Northumberland and the Galloway. Um, collar. To get a better sky than you can actually find in Exmoor, where do you have to go? Well, an appreciably better one, you have to go right to the northwest tip of Scotland. Okay, somewhere like Harris or Lewis or some of the tiny islands or the Ascent Peninsula or anywhere up there. Uh, the trouble is it's horizontal rain and 50 mile an hour winds, so you might not want to do that. So I think these are really illustrative maps that show you just how much we have to gain by, um, by the dark sky tourism. Just tell me a second while I get back in. Am I back with you now? Excellent, excellent. So I think what we'll do in session one of our practical sessions coming up, we'll have a look at light pollution. We'll have a look about why dark skies matter in a bit more detail. It's not always obvious. There are other reasons why we should want dark skies and tranquility, the characterfulness of an area. And most importantly, perhaps of all that wildlife, nocturnal wildlife depends on dark skies and we're eroding the night sky for them. We'll talk about marketing and in particular what I'll do is I'll give you some case studies of other people that either I've worked with or we're aware of. They've really done fantastic work with dark skies. In, in one case, one hotel has actually invested £150,000 in its very own observatory. Okay, And it now gets nearly 20% of its entire yearly income from stargazing packages. So their people have made an investment. Other hotels or, or small um, campsites or small pubs just run astronomy weekends, get an astronomer to come. And you, it's surprising. You'd have thought the weather's going to kill things like that. In our experience, it doesn't. People understand you can have a cloudy night. And when you have a cloudy night, you just wait for a clear night. When you get a clear night under an Exmoor sky or a Northumberland sky or Yorkshire Dale sky, it's unforgettable. Okay. We're also going to cover practical stargazing. I know from that um, um, feedback form that Katrina sent on that many of you had signed up to, you actually said that um, some of you got a little bit of stargazing knowledge. Have we got any experts on the screen? Anybody who's an expert in stargazing, put your hand up. Okay, that's nobody. Anybody who has got a basic knowledge, put your hand up. Okay. Well done, Ginny. There you go. So we'll start from scratch and we'll go on about trying to help you um, navigate the night sky. We'll show you some free resources you can use. And sometimes I think when you've got guests, even if you can just point out one or two things, that's all you need to do really. And if you want a more specialist help, then we'll try and identify experts that you might be able to call on to deliver some of these stargazing sessions. We'll show you how to find the planets. We'll show you how to find um, things that are just particularly good at that time of year. Um, and we'll also set some practical tasks, if you like. We'll also, importantly, cover, cover equipment. So can I ask how many people have got binoculars that are on this screen? Put your hand up if you've got binoculars. All right. Well, these are the binoculars I was using last night. And who's seen the comet? Anybody seen the comet? All right. Well, these are the best instrument to look at the comet, okay? And these are a 42-pound um, pair of binoculars bought from a, a firm in Exeter. First Light Optics are very good. So we'll show you what's the best binoculars as well. And also, you know, whether you need to mount them or perhaps what kind of size of binoculars. Should you get some very, very big binoculars 
or is something lightweight and practical going to be the best options? Well, I think I've led you into the answer to that. We'll also talk about um, telescopes. Does anybody have a telescope on the screen? Hands up. Okay. Okay, that's just one of you, by the way. I will introduce this guy. Okay. This is a great big telescope, isn't it? That's what you need. You are, everybody in the Exmoor should be given one of these by the National Park, in my opinion. It's like a bazooka, and I've been stopped more than once by uh, Her Majesty's Constabulary asking what the hell I'm doing with this thing out in the wilds. So this telescope um, I bought, basically, because I was doing so many star parties in national parks, and it throws in the back of my car, and you put it under a dark sky like Exmoor, and my God, it's unbelievable what you can see. You know, objects that where the light's taken two million years to get to you look fantastic with structure and detail. You think it shouldn't be possible, but it is. But these kind of telescopes, these are called wide, wide field refractors. This actual big guy only costs about 200 pounds. Okay, so it's possible to buy something which is really usable, which is pretty portable, and which is going to wow your guests. And you could actually almost leave this with your guests. They're fairly durable and easy to use. We'll cover all that kind of detail as well. And also we'll cover things like, you know, what you might want to buy for, for your guests. And these particularly, can we all see my red light? This is the red light of astronomy and one or two other nefarious activities, okay? So this is the light that we use when we do astronomy because it doesn't interfere with your night vision. So, you know, we'd recommend that you always have a few of these available for your guests. This particular one costs 10 pounds. Um, and it cycles through white as well, but we don't like white LED light. In fact, it's one of the big enemies of stargazing, and, and that's something we'll cover as well. What you might do with your own property in terms of having a little dark sky area. Can I just check? I don't know where you're all from, but the kind of properties that you run, the kind of businesses that you run, are you all under a dark sky, or are some of you in, in small, in the middle of small communities? So who's, under, who's in a small community? Hands up. And who's in the sticks, so to put, right in the wilds? Okay. Well, everywhere down Exmoor is pretty wild compared with everywhere else. So a lot of the stuff we talk about will be applicable, I think, to everybody. Okay. So I think that's probably just to round it up and give you a taste of the way we'll be doing this. I'll be doing this with my partner, who's um, um, Neil. And Neil runs Go Stargazing. So if you don't know what Go Stargazing, it's a web portal. Neil started it as a not-for-profit exercise really to list events of where people could go and places to stargaze all over the country not just in the north where he's based but all over and since then it's gone on from leaps to bounds it's got lots of lots of followers and i think as part of this neil's going to provide you with free listings on that website so that's one way you can actually reach potential customers that might make a difference to your businesses i'll just leave you with one parting thought before i am back to dan and that's at stargazing um is something which has been popular for a long time. I always wonder when I do these presentations whether people think it's just a passing fad, something that's going to peak and then sort of go, go down a little bit, a bit like mountain biking did, I think. Um, well, I started Star Parties for the Public back in 1992, and the very first one we ran um, was just an overwhelming number of people came. And ever since, all the Star Parties we've organised through the 1990s have been universally popular okay it's never really stopped in popularity so i think it's probably just going to carry on and it's a question of whether your position really take advantage of it okay so we'll talk about that more when we do the sessions but i think for the time being and one last thing if i just leave the party for a while i'll be rejoining because i just noticed my laptop here is about to run out of juice so um i'll hand back to you dan um i'll let you carry on from there brilliant thank you richard that was really really helpful i think to set the scene and certainly getting me excited to go back out and have to say i went out last night for the first time in a very long time and hungry beacon and looked up at the comet and the milky way and saturn and jupiter and it, it it every time you kind of go under those dark skies and really take the time out to do it i think you know it certainly refreshes the soul and i think that's what we can kind of sell to many of our visitors who who don't have that opportunity to do it in the same way um, okay, so I'm going to hand over to Katrina now, who's going to lead you through some of the opportunities that we're going to be working on with you over the next six to 12 months. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, 
so hi everybody. The, the first um, thing I'm going to talk about is the Dark Sky Friendly Business Accreditation Scheme, um, which hopefully you've come this far and you'll in, uh, join us on the rest of the journey. Um, the three sessions that Richard has just talked about are going to be quite a key element towards getting that accreditation. They won't be obligatory, but obviously the idea is that we are delivering um, a really good service to potential stargazers and potential stargazing audiences. So um, by increasing your knowledge as a business, your knowledge of how to market yourself and how to promote the opportunities for people to come here and what they can get involved in, whether or not you decide to actually progress individual experiences yourself um, is something that's really key to that. So as I say, um, the three sessions um, will start, we're hoping uh, they will start in August and one in September. The idea is going to be very much that then come autumn or, and certainly in time for the Dark Sky Festival, that businesses have um, increased their confidence, they've increased their knowledge, they've uh, had time to introduce maybe some new services that might be of interest to stargazers, they've had time to think about their own premises and to make sure that they're addressing things like the light pollution that they might be giving out from their own premises. And that's obviously what we want your support with as a national park. Um, all those things to make sure that we are continuing to conserve our dark skies, because that's at the, at the heart of it all. Um, but obviously looking at every opportunity that we can. And as tourism we want, and, and Dan and I in our sustainable economy department, it, it's all about trying to you know, bring people in here and have them spending money and enjoy what's available. We recognize um, completely that um, the stargazing is, is an additional offer to all the other things that people are coming for, as well as there might be some prospective um, individualized um, individuals who want to come here just for stargazing, but really anyone who's coming here for the landscape, the outdoors, the tranquility is, is really going to be interested in the offer and that's um, the people that we want to attract. And we want to be able to say to those people, look, these businesses are dark sky friendly accredited. They've taken steps to make sure they have a better understanding, that they can engage with you better about dark skies. Some of them can probably point out some constellations um, and some of them uh, will have some binoculars or might have a telescope or have a little guidebook to help you with your stargazing. So that's what we're looking for from businesses. Um, it will be a uh, quite a simple application process, uh, application form. Um, which you will be able to complete once you've undertaken the three sessions with Go Stargazing. Um, and you'll probably find having a look at your own business and the steps that you automatically think, actually, that will be good for me, that will be good for me, that you probably will fairly easily be able to meet the criteria, criteria if your passion is there to, to see the opportunity. So, um, as I say, the form, the form is available. We won't be opening for applications until the three sessions have completed. Um, but there will be advantages for being accredited. Obviously, it's a tool for yourselves to use in your own marketing, to have on your own websites um, and to use in your own social media. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we will be having a, a basic listing of accredited businesses on our National Park Stargazing page. Um, and as Richard mentioned, Go Stargazing um, have kindly offered to add our accredited businesses to their website as well. So you're looking at, you know, Ex obviously extensive exposure in terms of the National Park website and obviously some really good national exposure from the Go Stargazing website as well. So it's all free and there's some really good opportunities and we hope that you will embrace us on those. The, um, the next thing I'm going to just talk about is the, uh, the Dark Skies Festival. Now, as I mentioned and Richard mentioned, one of the things he'll be covering in his sessions is giving you confidence in knowing what to look for. Um, on the last of the sessions, he's going to be talking particularly about what, to, what you can expect to see in the autumn sky and around October, which obviously ties in really well with the Dark Skies Festival. Now, um, this is actually going to be our, our fourth year. Now, it will be somewhat different. And as you can imagine, um, from organizing events perspective, it's very difficult at the moment, but it will be going ahead in some form or other. We will be um, holding events as the National Park. And what's happened in previous years is that we've um, invited and encouraged other organizations, be they community organizations or businesses um, to, or pubs, to, to run events themselves. So hopefully 
there's still going to be some other businesses coming on board. We've already got some businesses who have adapted what they can offer and are going to be running events like guided stargazing, in a, mixed in with a pub supper. Um, so we have a festival web page which is up and running now and as and when I get more information. Um, from the National Parks perspective, what we're looking at running is predominantly smaller outdoor events that we, that we know us, we can safely manage. They're slightly weather dependent, but some of them will crack on anyway. As, as Dan mentioned, we've always had a good turnout even for events when it's, the weather isn't good. So um, there'll be a, a good range of events, uh, or as good a range as we can manage in the current situation. Um, and in addition to that, there will be some virtual um, events, which will just, we hope, engage people more with our dark skies and also then provide an opportunity for the dark sky accredited businesses to get involved with. So yeah, hopefully you'll be on board with all that. The, um, both of these aspects uh, are part of a wider project where we're looking to improve uh, astro tourism to, to bring more people to the area and to appreciate the space we have. We had a meeting last year um, with some of the stargazing um, and some businesses where we talked through some ideas about what might add um, benefit to the area and what might attract more people to come. Um, obviously, we don't have huge amounts of money, so we're not going to be suddenly setting up observatories and um, that sort of thing, but there's quite a few things that we identified that we could do that, that we saw could um, benefit tourism to the area. Um, amongst those, one of the things that was mentioned was that Although, yes, there's loads of places on Exmoor you can go where you can appreciate the dark skies, um, but we wanted to develop one particular walk, a short walk, which could be safely done at night that we could promote as um, being like a dark skies way or a dark skies trail. Uh, we've already done some work on that with the help of um, David, who's one of our volunteers, who's a keen astronomer. Um, now, that's been, we were hoping to have that launch ready for this year's Dark Skies Festival. But as you can imagine, in the last month, um, that's come to a bit of a standstill. Um, so we will still be um, organising that. It will be promoted via a leaflet um, and it will be downloadable and we'll have quite a big campaign when we do launch it. But we won't now launch that until next year. Um, but that's still very much in our, in our mindset. And that will help uh, give a focal point to people to go, OK, well, I can come, but what should I do when I get there? So we can say, well, why don't you go and do the Dark Skies Walk? Another thing that we also see as being um, a real benefit to the area is to have some sort of um, hub area where it's just, a, again, a focal point to say, well, there's a, there's a viewing platform at X location where you can go, where there's people locally who can help you with stargazing. There's a little bit of equipment you can, they can help you with, and it's a really good location for X, Y, Z reason. That's something, so at the moment, in, when we talk about it internally, we talk about it as a dark sky hub. Um, um, looking at at the minute and considering suitable locations that might be um, good for that. We are considering whether that might work best on a, a, a land owned by the National Park, um, but we haven't ruled out and we're certainly at the moment considering that actually if there was a particular location with Exmoor where there were relevant businesses who were really keen to have the dark sky hub in their in their community and they could all show how they could support it because obviously longevity and sustainability is really key um, then we would consider all those locations and we do have um, a small amount of funding and I say a small amount but enough to have a platform and maybe get some minimal equipment in um, but we do have some money set aside for that so that's something we'll be progressing again um, when the circumstances allow. The uh, as part of the training that we're offering now with the three sessions which are kindly being hosted by Go Stargazing, we also want to give businesses the opportunity to get even more um, in-depth training. Um, and we have um, some funding set aside for some local one-to-one -one training. Um, so we will be recruiting a, um, a sort of a part-time contractor who's a stargazing astronomer to um, with some business and engagement knowledge to come and see you. So if, if you decide to progress, everyone else has got interference or just me? It's gone again. Um, so yeah, so if we uh, want to progress, if you particularly want to progress and become even more expert, 
then there will be the opportunity to sign up for some one-to-one -one training uh, with a local trainer, which I think will be really key for those who are really enthused and can see the opportunities and want to offer stargazing experiences themselves. And rather than having a, a accommodation that's dark sky friendly, those businesses who want to take it a step further and perhaps want to pursue a bit of stargazing experiences as something additional to what they can offer at the minute. So they're all um, really good opportunities, I think, for everyone to get involved and hopefully, you know, people will feel enthusiastic about them. We certainly hope they will. Um, also, as businesses that want to become accredited, um, we would like to obviously to work closely with you from the National Park Centres where you can already go and pick up your free dark sky, uh, dark sky pocket guides, which talks about locations for people to go and stargaze generally. <clears throat> There's also going to be a, um, a downloadable uh, information pack, which um, again, our volunteer David has been helping us with. It's going to be specifically aimed at fairly serious astronomers. So not audiences that we perhaps personally will ever get to the level of being able to um, talk to them about their level of uh, need. But actually, in order to them here, um, David's um, set out a document whereby in black and white, we'll be able to say, this is exactly where you want to go. And for all the myriad of reasons as to what they're going to find important, things like the horizons from the land, what's facing where, if there is light pollution, which direction it might be coming from, uh, suitability of the landscape for taking your equipment, parking arrangements, all that sort of thing. So that um, astronomer's pack is what we're calling it at the minute. It might have some fancy name. Um, but again, that will be a free resource that's available to you as businesses to attract um, the more serious stargazers as well, without any need for you to have that really um, much higher level of knowledge. Also at the National Park Centres, we are keen, as I mentioned, for you to engage with us there. And we're keen to um, help you in uh, stocking up on certain things that you might want, like telescopes or binoculars. And we're offering a 20% discount on um, those astronomy uh, pieces of equipment to uh, the businesses who want to pursue trade. So there's quite a few opportunities for you all. The first steps that we're going to go on to next will be um, me fixing the dates for the three sessions with Richard. As part of that, there's a registration form already completed, um, and some haven't. Um, but on that registration form, it basically helps us make sure that the training is um, at the right level for the audience. Um, so it talks about what your level of knowledge is now and what your, what your aspiration is in terms of your areas of um, knowledge and improvement. And it will just help us really understand you as an audience for, um, for our sort of, you know, improving our businesses. Um, once I've got those registration forms all completed um, and we're taking a little view on that to see what suits most people, at the moment, uh, the businesses that have already completed those forms, um, there seems to be a slight inclination towards um, evening sessions, to those three sessions being evening sessions, but obviously we will review that and um, it's not something that we can keep running, but we can possibly record them, but we'll see. But the idea is that um, as soon as these two introductory sessions, the one today and the one tomorrow, have been completed, that we'd like everyone who then wants to take the registration form so we know exactly how many businesses we're dealing with. Um, just in case you're wondering in terms of um, how many businesses we're expecting or not, um, we don't have any targets ourselves in terms of, oh, we must have this many businesses. We would rather have some really good businesses who are really engaged with us, who you know want to make a decent job of it. Um, on today's call, I mean, as you know, some people haven't turned up. Um, there was about 14, pe 14 businesses um, who had expressed an interest who wanted to register for today um, and there's a similar amount registered on tomorrow so potentially we're looking late you know up to well 20 odd businesses between 20 30 40 businesses as an absolute top as the people who are likely to receive an accreditation um, those who you know some people may decide to drop out so you know it does potentially put you if you've got that accreditation as something quite key that you can really take advantage of and we hope to do so um, I think I've got the sun in my eyes, definitely still feeling. The, um, I think I've covered pretty much everything I wanted to. The, um, I'm just going to, uh, A, just going to close the curtain so I can see you all, and mute my mic.
whilst uh, you have a think and any questions that you might want to raise either way, wave your hand or put your hand Great, so yeah, there's obviously a lot to take in from this evening, but if anybody's got any immediate questions. Richard, did you have anything more to say about what the three sessions will cover, or do you, you think what you've given kind of is sufficient? I want to force them to tune in on the night. <laughs> Keep my power to dry. I do, I do think the accreditation scheme that, that Katrina said, um, Northumberland operated one of those. It got designated and then it, it brought one in into 2014 and that's proved really popular. Um, um, Durham, Visit Durham have started doing it and um, the Yorkshire Dales are just about to start like, like we are in Exmoor and the North York Moor started a couple of months ago and they've already got over 20 businesses signed up. And they're, they're all sorts of businesses. They could be a guide almost or they could be campsites. So, I mean, the full, the full ramp of hospitality businesses have signed up. To me, it's a complete no-brainer. If you've got something above your head, people really want to see. It's magical seeing starry skies when you're not used to them. Absolutely magical. And so getting that mark will distinguish you straight away. And if I was looking to go somewhere like Exmoor, I would take care to look for those with that mark. So it means you've thought about it and you're committed to it and just distinguish yourself from other people a little bit. So I really back that scheme. It's proven its work in other areas. It's become very, very popular. So why not why not get a head start on other people? Back to you, Dan. Great. Thank you for that. That was really helpful. If anybody's got any questions, if you want to raise your hand now, if I get all of you, we'll just take you one at a time and we'll we'll see how we get on. Um if you don't get a chance to ask anything or you think of something afterwards, do drop Katrina's probably the best person to drop an email to and she'll then forward that on to whoever to help you with that. So so don't don't worry if you don't get to kind of ask anything now. But has anybody got any comments, any questions, any queries, any thoughts they want to share? Are we all hungry and wanting our dinner? Okay, fantastic. Well, it, it, it looks like we've hopefully covered everything and, and a bit more. So um, we'll probably call it there. I'll, I'll leave it to Katrina to have a few final words if she's got anything else to say. And other than that, we'll say thank you very much and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. So Katrina, do you, have you got anything else? Yeah, sure. Um, I was just going to say that what I will do um, tomorrow, I know some of you might have had it already, but I'll send you all the registration form um, to sign up for Richard's three sessions. So hopefully if you can get that back to me, um, you know, without too much of a delay, then I can take your feedback into account when we fix the dates. Um, but that will be the next step for all of us. But no, thank you very much for joining everybody. And um, Richard, you might want to say a final word about tonight's asteroid and where everyone can go and find it. I was going to say that. Yeah, it's not an asteroid, Katrina. It's a comet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is a comet. It's a rarity. Um, comets um, are sexy things because we get very, very few naked eye comets. We've been very unlucky in the Northern Hemisphere. And the last really great ones were a couple called uh, Comet Ayakataki um, back in about 1996 and uh, Hale-Bopp. And they were the last ones that were really good. Well, anyway, this one called Comet Neowise, or Neowise rather, just rather caught us unawares. And it's actually now in the northern sky. So most of you probably can identify the plough in the northern sky. Yeah, are we all okay with the plough? Okay, if you go and if it's clear down there tonight, um, you'll probably be able to see it from 11.30 onwards. Yeah, probably 11.30. If you just leave it till 12 midnight, and if you're prepared to stay through all the night, you're going to be in for a treat. But it gets higher and higher. But you just need to look below the bowl of the plough, if you like, the bowl of the plough. Look down and look to the right. Get your eye attuned to the darkness and you're looking for a comet, which is sort of perpendicular. It's on its end, if you like. There'll be a stellar core, a nucleus, which looks quite bright like a star. And then all of a sudden, the more you look, the tail will pop into view. A friend of mine was out, um, he went all the way up to the Peak District yesterday because that's where he's doing some work. And he went to a suitable location last night at 12.30 in the morning and told me it was actually busy. Everybody taking a picture of the comet. And it's on a downward trend now, so it's going to fade a little bit, but it's currently still naked eye. And from Exmoor, because the moon's not up tonight, it would look fantastic. So look to the north, let your eye get dark attuned. You're looking for a little star-like object, if you like, and then the more you look at it, the more the tail will sort of leap into view. 
and people have been taking fantastic pictures from across the United Kingdom of this comet. Some marvellous, marvellous pictures. It's really caught the public imagination. But it's that kind of event that just crops up through the air, like meteor showers, um, like northern lights, like the Milky Way coming back, like the planets being very well placed, like Mars is going to look the best it's looked in 30 years in October. Things like this are now feeds through to the public, through newspapers and the media. And this is where Exmoor and areas like Exmoor can really, can really sort of do well for showing the prime position to get the best views anywhere in England. So, yeah, I just encourage you to go out there tonight, see the comet, so you can choke a comet off. See a comet before you die. That's my recommendation tonight. That's brilliant. Thank you, Richard. Um, and then just to, just in case you're all um, on watching ITV tonight, or you're not watching ITV, you might want to put it on. Um, Jenny from Wild About Exmoor, who's a local company who do guided walks and she does stargazing experiences. Um, but she was uh, featuring on tonight uh, on the evening show live, but I think it's being recorded and shown tonight as well, talking about the comet and uh, talking about Exmoor Dark Skies. So just an example of the sort of interest and the exposure that we can get if we all work together. Right, I think we'll let everyone go and have their supper. Thank you very much, everybody. Clear skies. Thanks, thanks, Richard.